morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am C uh, CCL Senior Director of Education and Engagement, Brett Cease, and I get to be your host today. We're so glad that you're joining us for our monthly call on such a historic moment today and to help us commemorate the largest U.S. climate bill that's ever passed both the Senate and the House. We've prepared a special agenda with some fun cameos and toasts, so I hope that you brought your toasting glass with you. And to start us off today, let's hear a special message from the Chair of Citizens Climate Education herself to all of you, Dr. Natasha Dijarnet. CCL volunteers, your work was essential in helping us get the IRA across the finish line. Your involvement helped generate the critical ingredient, which is political will. The importance and persistence of not giving up was echoed throughout. You were persistent and you did not give up. This was a historic bill, the largest climate policy package ever passed by the U.S. Senate. But we're not done. We will keep going. Well, here is to that. As Natasha said, we are celebrating a significant milestone today, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, containing the biggest package of climate solutions ever passed by the U.S. Congress. We'll also have a few updates from our senior staff. And since we know at CCL our work is not done, I'll also be sure to review our August action sheet after all of that. So jumping right in, it's convenient that our speakers today just happen to be two people who know and love CCL. And in fact, they're both board members. We have joining us today, Bob Inglis, a former member of Congress serving as a Republican from South Carolina's fourth congressional district from 1993 to 1999. And again, from 2005 to 2011, Bob has been working tirelessly to move his party towards climate action through the organization he founded and that many of us are a part of, Republic EN, a grassroots community building effort that provides educational support for conservatives committed to building public understanding of free enterprise and its promise to solve energy and climate challenges. And also joining us today is the amazing Princella Talley. Princella is a Public Voices Fellow of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and a writing coach with the Op-Ed Project whose writing has been featured in numerous publications throughout the country. Princella also worked previously for a Citizens Climate Education as our Development Coordinator and Diversity Outreach Coordinator and as a dear personal friend. So I've got three questions that I wanna make sure to get your thoughts on Bob and Princella. And then if there's time, we'll open it up to one or two questions from the audience. So for all of those of you tuning in, make sure to start putting in anything you'd like to ask Princella or Bob in the Q&A box. And I'll ask one of you for your thoughts on that question. And then before we move on to the next question, we'll make sure to get the other's thoughts as well. That sounds good. So let's start with the basics and we'll start with you, Princel, if that's all right. Uh, would you each tell us just a little bit more about yourself than I just did and include in that what you are personally pleased about at this moment in the climate movement? Hello, hello, CCL. Well, I am Princella Talley. I'm here in Pineville, Louisiana with three dogs, two of which are puppies. So if you hear any disruption, that is what the noise is. And I currently work as a fellow at large at the Op-Ed Project, as Brett mentioned. And in short, that includes fellowship coaching, mentoring to help fellows get uh, published op-eds. And one area where I do currently coach is on the climate crisis. So I've been a part of CCL since 2016, and I'm now on the governing board alongside Bob. And outside of that, I'm a speaker who enjoys speaking most about impactful creativity. So how do you access impactful creativity within yourself? How do you think outside the box in ways that make you a more well-rounded individual who can help people see themselves, not just as everyday citizens, but really as big players in a world that even when you're doing everyday things, the odds of us being born and being here together now is like what, one in 400 trillion. So based on that alone, the most everyday person is so extraordinary. And I like to speak to that. And what I'm pleased about in this movement is how it's not just science and policies anymore. It's about the human experience. And I see that most in a lot of the materials I read and interviews and books. I finally read the book, All That We Can Save, uh, Catherine Wilkinson and Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson's book. And it just blew me away. I mean, with the humanity and the way it called to action through human experience. And that'd be my answer there. Did I miss anything, Brett? That sounds amazing. Thank you. I'm so grateful just to get a little bit more of a window in, Princella. And Bob, how about you? Well, it's great to be with you. And, uh, you know, so 
Uh, I'm this guy that uh, spent six years uh, disputing or really did not paying attention to climate change in the U.S. Congress, and then out six years, came back for another six with a different affect because of uh, my son and four daughters, um, a trip to Antarctica, and then being inspired by the faith of an Aussie climate scientist who uh, uh, challenged me to look closer. And so... Um, that turned me into a guy that was uh, real hepped up on solving climate, um, which was not good in a Republican primary situation. Um, but uh, after, after getting tossed out of Congress in 2010, I've been uh, working, as you said, Brett, with uh, RepublicEN.org. So we're conservatives who care about climate change and who are trying to help conservatives to overcome the world's most undeserved inferiority complex. Apparently, conservatives think they're no good on energy and climate. And so when the topic came up in the previous years, they'd sort of shrink in science denial. Now they're sort of saying, well, but how do we get China in? And so what we want to help them to see is, oh, no, there are ways, there are ways to get China in. And um, so um, and at this moment, what I'm uh, very excited about, this call is well-timed because of the passage of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act um, in a process that no Republican could vote for because it's reconciliation. And reconciliation is a process that basically is used by a fragile majority to cram down the throats of a minority its views. Uh, we did it as Republicans. Uh, Democrats have done it just recently. Um, it's sort of the way it is. Um, it's a tool. It's not a great tool, but it worked in this case to get some climate provisions. Here's the thing that's exciting to me at this point, though, is I think that it'll show the importance of a worldwide solution. This Inflation Reduction Act is going to help us here in America with a whole bunch of clean energy credits uh, that basically affect the tax uh, taxes of American corporations. But I think the good news for those of us uh, that want a worldwide solution, that's of course everyone in CCL, um, there's going to be a need to, to focus on the next. And the next really involves carbon pricing and a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So that's what I'm excited about. Well, here's to that. I think we're incredibly excited about that next step, too, that you laid out in your vision there, Bob. And I think um, if it's all right with you, I'll start with you building on that for this next question. Then we'll go back to you, Princella. As you know, at CCL, we like to reach for everyone. And that means we have to keep reminding ourselves that people can do the same event very differently sometimes. And so with regard to the energy or the Inflation Reduction Act, rather, I think it's important to acknowledge that it's an imperfect bill passed through a compromise process. And yet, given this, it's what we have. And what do you think the people you work with like and dislike about it? And it's helpful for us to keep in mind. Well, I think what's interesting is once the, the sting of reconciliation is over, I think we'll find Republicans not really criticizing the, the energy provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act um, because it's got a lot of things that Republicans would probably want to do. Um, um, expanded credits for wind and solar, uh, new credits for hydrogen and nuclear. Uh, those are things that have a constituency on the right. Um, and so in places like Texas and Iowa, um, you'll find Republicans in the next 18 months to two years probably sort of celebrating those things that are happening in wind and solar and and uh, hopefully in nuclear and hopefully in, in uh, hydrogen. And so um, it, it's sort of like the way I've described reconciliation. It'd be sort of like this, your employer coming in and dropping a contract on your desk and saying, take it or leave it. Um, that's what reconciliation is. Um, it's not a very nice way to be uh, offered your next contract, but after you get over the sting of that, if the contract is okay, in other words, you're getting paid what you wanna get paid, <laughs> wasn't a very polite way to do it, but uh, you'll probably be happy uh, in, in, uh, after a number of months. That's where we'll be, I think, on the Republican side. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective, especially both on the policy, but also the process itself. 
What would you say, Prinsal, to that same question, especially keeping in mind, what do we think the people that you work with like and dislike about the Inflation Reduction Act? So the folks that I'm speaking with, they're happy with the push towards the renewable energy and clean energy sources, because you know where there's less emissions, there's less pollution in their neighborhoods. But at the same time, there's a rightful concern that's still out there about some of the clean energy resources still ending up inaccessible in the same neighborhoods that are most impacted. So the question is, are these tax credits going to result in more solar, et cetera, in these very same neighborhoods? And it's an important question to think about. And you know, with this being a 10-year plan, it's already been raised that less than 1% of that non-defense discretionary budget is going to go towards environmental justice investments. So it's still something where, as you said, Brett, we have to acknowledge that it's imperfect, but keep the conversation open. Well, I think this is a great forum to really start exploring and unpacking all of that. And I guess just building on that for you, Princella, we'll take this question for everyone, uh, ask Princella and Bob, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, given all of your reflections, what is your advice about how we as CCL volunteers can best engage with or communicate with the people that you work with about the Inflation Act or the Inflation Reduction Act or climate policy in general? Is that going to bother me first? We'll, we'll pass it to you if that's all right first, Princella. Sounds good. I mean, to me, being optimistic about it, targeting billions of dollars towards environmental justice, that's incredible progress. And it signals hope for even more progress to come. So yes, we have to bring up the sore spots that when a bill is passed as law, environmental justice can be left behind and all of the empty promises that pulled in the support from these communities, it's gone now. And then you're left with nothing when the bill passes. So when we're communicating about that, I think it's a great, great time to talk to people outside of the CCL solutions framework. And the best way to do that is be authentic. I mean, do your research. You can have your talking points based on the matter, but above all else, be human. I mean, because no group is a monolith. So you'll have people who will find this bill problematic. You'll have people who think it's great and, and have no worries about it. But when you do face that opposition, know that it's making us all better because it's helping us to all think in new ways. And if we're open enough to receive the feedback, these conversations become easier than we think because at the end of the day, we're not a set of policies. We're a world of multidimensional people. I love that. That is so powerful. And I think that is ringing true to all of us listening in, Princella. What would you say, Bob, to that same question? Well, I think the thing to do is um, back to that uh, analogy of, of the contract being dropped on your desk and uh, told that uh, take it or leave it. Um, you probably don't want to be in the, if that happened to you, you wouldn't want to your colleague next door in the next door office to say, yeah, they got you, didn't they? They told you what's what. Um, you want to do that. You'd want to just uh, approach Republicans with the awareness that they're, they're going to be sore about that a little bit. And so if you're talking to Republicans, um, just uh, be talking about the next steps and then um, gently celebrate the successes in the Inflation Reduction Act um, and, and talk about uh, the strength, really, of CCL, which is the worldwide um, a carbon border adjustment mechanism. That is the, that's the missing piece. Um, and I think that we will find Republicans very open to that. We already see some openness there. People like Senator Kramer uh, of North Dakota and uh, Senator Cassidy of Louisiana are talking about a carbon tariff bill. Might have some challenges with the World Trade Organization there, but there are ways that that can start the conversation that overcomes the current mental block on the right, which is how you get China in on this. Um, and so, so in other words, um, probably not best to spike the football in the end zone. Probably best to uh, humbly, uh, you know, walk uh, back toward uh, the, the the line of scrimmage rather than spiking the ball. So. Um, uh, and and uh, and and realize that um, that uh, now comes the real strength of CCL is coming forward with that worldwide solution. 
Well, we are incredibly excited about that opportunity too. I know in our June lobby days, that was one of our primary asks that we we're focused, especially in a lot of offices on the conservative side to talking about. So uh, we look forward to continuing to build and highlight that solution for that carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, if it's all right with both of you, let's go to the phones for a little bit. Flannery, I know that you've been monitoring our Q&A and we've got time at least for one, if not two questions. Um, what's emerging that you see from the attendees? Yes, indeed. All right. So our most upvoted question is from Mike, and they ask, I'm optimistic that the CBAM idea, which stands for Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, uh, as expressed in the bill recently introduced by Senator Whitehouse, uh, and there's been lots of discussion in Congress about CBAMs, um, uh, he says, I'm optimistic that it will garner bipartisan support since it should help U.S. industry be more competitive globally. Um, and they're asking if you have any thoughts uh, specifically, Bob, but we can open it up uh, in general. Yeah, well, I, I would say, yeah, exactly. That is the, that's what's exciting is it you see as you I mean, the, these. Republicans are generally for tax credits, right? I mean, uh, you give a Republican the opportunity to reduce taxes. Um, that's what credits do. They basically reduce taxes. Uh, you can do you can either reduce rates or you can reduce uh, uh, you, or you can implement credits, exemptions, or deductions. Um, a, a same a different path to the same outcome. So they sort of like those. And so that's why the Inflation Reduction Act provisions will be okay after the sting of reconciliation is over. But then comes, like say, this incredible opportunity to say, yeah, and let's address that very legitimate question you have, um, Mr. or Mrs. Conservative, that, yeah, how do you get China in on this? And uh, that's what Senator Whitehouse is doing in that bill that you're speaking of there. Um, and um, that's really the next step. Um, I think one of the one of the key questions really facing the eco right, as we call it, uh, you know, the it's a balance to the environmental left. We've got the eco right. Um, and CCL is wonderful in growing the conservative caucus of CCL to to grow that eco right. Um, is you got over there some people that are incrementalist, and then you've got people that are maybe what you might call vanguardist. And so the incrementalist, I think, really um, have achieved a great deal here in this bill just passed. It's we're doing American clean energy. Um, now comes the focus on the vanguardist, which is what CCL is, along with us at republicen.org, people who really are focused on getting the world in. And that is that mechanism, that carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, so uh, I don't know if you want to go into all the details about how that works. I'll well, just give you this quick example so you can pass it on, hopefully, when you're meeting with a member of Congress or something. It's like this, a sheet of flat steel is coming through the port of Seattle right now. Um, we apply our carbon tax. China objects in the World Trade Organization. They say, you can't do that. That's an impermissible tariff. We think they lose that case based on precedents in the chemical industry that say you can have a content tax on the stuff coming into your country. And this would be a carbon content tax. If we're right and that's upheld, China 24 hours later, because they do have an amazing way of reaching consensus in China, um, they'd have the same price on carbon dioxide because they just paid in Seattle a carbon tax that got remitted to Washington, D.C. If they collected that tax inside China, the tax money would end up in their capital, not ours, and the sheet of flat steel would come through Seattle with no adjustment. So then you got China following our lead. And here's a kicker that you can pass on to conservatives. No international agreement. No bowing and scraping at the UN. No protracted negotiations just a bold move by the United States. And that's really exciting. It's using the power of the American marketplace to get the world in. And that's what I think Senator Whitehouse is focused on. What's not to like, right? Well put, thank you so much, Bob, for that. Uh, Flanner, I think we have time for one more, if that's all right. And then again, a reminder for all those that we don't have time for today, please go to CCL Community Forums where we'll make sure to follow up after this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our next most upvoted question is from Mindy. Um, and she says, sometimes it feels like the two sides are speaking different languages and not hearing each other. Can you help us think about the language we can use to bring together our polarized politics on the issue of climate change that might lead to bipartisan legislation? Princella, would you like to take that one first? 
Sure. Yeah, it definitely feels that way sometimes. The first thing, going back a little bit to what I said earlier about doing your research, you can learn to speak that language a bit because it is really polarizing right now. Or what you can do is when you go into these spaces where I speak a different language from you, say that up front. Um, I'm here to find common ground with you. I may not speak the same language as you, but I do think we share a common goal and I want to know how we can achieve that. When you lay out the expectations and your willingness to communicate in a different way, I think people respect that. And I think a lot of what we're missing in this really polarized time is the very basic nature of people being able to respect each other, regardless of their differences. And that can be stated up front. Well put. How about you, Bob? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, the thing I would add, I guess, is is the more we can speak about what unites us than what divides us, the better. Um, and climate is a uniquely uniting experience. Um, we, we are all experiencing climate change. Um, some places are harder hit than others. Uh, but, uh, for example, with wildfire smoke, it doesn't matter whether you live in a mansion or a hovel. Um, you are dealing with climate change. Um, and, and so if we can talk a lot about what unites us, our common experience, I think that we will put aside some of the partisanship on climate um, and, um, and say, listen, we, we've sort of been doing this experiment on our common home. And uh, the polarized world, we sit in this Petri dish with medium and we're picking up handfuls of medium having a food fight with it. Um, but we are in the Petri dish. Uh, we, we need to uh, um, get somebody to turn down the Bunsen burner underneath this Petri dish because uh, it's, it's getting hot in here. Um, and so that's just it, it focus a lot on what unites us, particularly when you're talking to Republicans. It'll help them to um, uh, to see that, uh, hey, they're needed. Um, and I, I might add that, too, is just make sure we don't have any cancel um, culture out there. You know, uh, there's. Um, we, we really need everyone in on this. Uh, and uh, that's, it's so important to not signal that, hey, we don't need you anymore. You're like passe. No, no, we don't care how old you are or how sort of passe you are. We need you. We need everybody on this. And that'll help people feel that they've got a place. Well, here's to that. I think both of you are really highlighting that common ground, that element of bridge building that we as a CCL nation and larger international community are really all about. And I think that you're both getting a lot of love in the chat here. Somebody's even saying that was the clearest and most compelling explanation of the CBAM I've ever heard. Thank you. Uh -huh. So thank you both, obviously, so much. I know that you both probably have plans for the weekend. Uh, we have deeply benefited from your wisdom and reflection, but Know that uh, we'd love to have you also stay on and enjoy the rest of the call with us if you're able to. Thanks. Enjoyed being Thank with you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Princella. Let's get a report now from Ben Pendergrass, CCL Senior Director of Government Affairs, who once told me that he likes to get bills passed. So I'm guessing this is a pretty good week for you, Ben. Feel free to go on video here and we'll spotlight you to get an update from DC. Good afternoon. Um, well, I want to touch on three things concerning passage of the Inflation Reduction Act 2022 that will hopefully be signed by the president in short order. First, I'd like to start with a brief history of this roller coaster ride, what's in the bill, and CCL's role in all of this. Let's start with a little recap of how we got here with this particular bill. The reconciliation process started in earnest last summer when Congress began work on the FY 2022 budget resolution that basically gave committees directions to start work on this package. You might remember sending what ended up being tens of thousands of emails and making tens of thousands of calls to Congress starting in July of that summer. Well, debate went on into the fall. The House passed their version of the reconciliation package called Build Back Better. However, the Senate was really where the most important negotiations were happening and a carbon price was even being seriously considered. Unfortunately, negotiations hit a wall in December of 2021. However, work continued to get folks back to the table, and you might remember making thousands of more calls, more emails urging Congress to not abandon climate ambition. 
We saw a new war in Ukraine that sent energy prices soaring. However, it appeared going into summer, we were back on track for a major climate package. Then in July, it appeared the package did not have the votes to advance and was effectively dead. Less than three weeks ago, almost everyone was surprised and happy to learn an agreement had been reached on the most important climate package ever. And as of yesterday, both chambers of Congress had passed it. One final note on the path of this bill, and Bob spoke to this. It's unfortunate, but we always knew this would be a partisan bill. Beginning in the 1990s, reconciliation has been used as a vehicle to overcome a potential filibuster from the party in the minority. And even if certain policies might have bipartisan support, the package as a whole, we knew would only ever receive votes from Democrats. And even that was something of a heavy lift. Well, let's move over to what is exactly in the IRA. First and most importantly, clean energy tax credits for any type of carbon-free energy. This is the biggest driver of emissions reductions in the bill. There's new tax credits for EVs. And perhaps one of the bigger surprises, if you remember back in June, Sarah Whitehouse, when he spoke to us, thought this provision was most likely to fall out of the bill. The bill would provide $60 billion in tax credits to boost domestic clean manufacturing. It includes $60 billion for environmental justice, sending new investments to communities long exposed to greater levels of pollution. Very happily, it includes a methane fee. Oil and gas companies beginning in 2025 will have a fee levied upon their methane emissions if it exceeds a certain threshold, which then escalates. It includes a major boost in incentives from carbon capture and storage. The package includes billions in financial assistance for homeowners to electrify and make their homes more energy efficient. It includes funding for forest restoration, USDA climate programs, and many, many more provisions. We know the bill does include provisions for the expansion of oil and gas leases. And these will have an impact and slightly increase those emissions, but for every ton in increases, it is estimated the bill will reduce emissions by 24 tons. That's a pretty good trade-off. There's way too much to cover here on this call, so I re recommend checking out Dana Nucitelli's webinar on the bill on community. Now, what does all these climate provisions get us? Well, the IRA puts us on a path to around 40% emissions reductions by 2030 from 2005 levels. And it's important to remember those reductions don't end there. And this would represent the biggest single climate investment in US history. And it will create around 1.5 million new jobs, prevent 180,000 premature American deaths between now and 2030. So a pretty big deal. Now, what was CCL's role in all of this? Well, as an organization, CCL was involved in meetings around reconciliation strategy as far back as the fall of 2019, and was in near constant contact with congressional champions and was working to expand the coalition, not just to put a price on carbon, but in support of the package as a whole. Most importantly though, you all should be proud of your contribution to this as climate advocates. It was never a foregone conclusion that climate would be at the center of this reconciliation package. It is only through years of advocacy, all the outreach, all the meetings with congressional offices and work in your communities that added momentum for major climate action. In all, you made almost 50,000 calls since last July to Congress and sent over 160,000 emails. And even though no Republicans voted for this bill, every movement towards climate action they made or votes they took on bipartisan climate bills made it easier for Democrats to put climate at the center of this bill and get it done. And you helped move them in that direction. I cannot put it more simply than this, that all your years of advocacy helped get this bill over the finish line. And don't just take it from me. Senator John Hinkenlooper has something to say to you all about that as well. Thank you, Citizens Climate Lobby. You guys have been terrific all the way through to get to the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the largest climate initiative in the history of the world. We couldn't have done without you with all your support, the phone calls, the emails, everything. Sky would still be waiting for a climate initiative that will change the world, the largest climate initiative ever. Thank you so much for all your hard work. All right, well, thank you, Ben, and congratulations, obviously, to our whole team. 
And to put all of that into context and continue our tradition of sharing some toasts, CCL's executive director and fear of the cedar for our first 13 years, Mark Reynolds sent us this toast to play for all of you. So I'll let Mark uh, share his toast from here. My toast to you is this. Thank you for the, being the kind of people that are willing to tackle the impossible. Here's to you. All right. Well, here's to the people who are willing to tackle the impossible. Besides all of the calls and emails that Ben noted, your summer lobbying also resulted in 35 new co-sponsors on the supporting bills that we asked you to lobby on. And for all of the educators out there this month, one of the other wonderful things that we just released is a climate classroom curriculum. So if you'd like to get involved with your local school, check that link out that I just put in the chat that our larger youth action team and Sharon Begatel headed up for you to use locally. Uh, the good people of Canada are also now receiving quarterly dividend checks in the good news department. They're officially called climate action incentive payments from their country's carbon fee. So it's been a wonderful month. And what I'd like us to do now is transition to briefly talk about this month's August action sheet, which we'll also put in the chat to reference as we walk through it later today. So overall, our overarching goal for these monthly actions is to help members of Congress develop an appetite for more and more climate legislation. So first off, what I'd like everyone to do is go to cclusa.org forward slash action to thank your Democratic members for their vote. We want them to be acknowledged and appreciated when they take steps forward on climate change solutions. And then the rest of this sheet this month is really all about building that appetite for more and more climate action in Congress. A little bit of background. Volunteers in Wisconsin dreamed up the notion of hosting a second Earth Day, six months after the April 22nd Earth Day event originally. So it's such a good idea that CCL is starting to roll that out nationally with this month's action. It's the first one. It's called Start Planning an October Earth Day Election Edition event. To keep it simple, you could decide to host a local event where you help Environmental Voter Project Phone Bank or Canvas to help get environmentalists ready to vote this fall. Or you might dust off and replicate an amazing Earth Day or outreach event you hosted a few years ago, again, here this fall. Our goal organizationally is that events all across the country help center climate change as a top issue for voters and to help make all of that possible and stitch together, our marketing and program teams will be providing you on the local level with logos, with resources, a social media packet towards that goal. And one of the things that you can tune into to find out more is the August 25th CCU for that launch in more details. And we'll also put that in the chat in just a bit. Our second action this month is focused on engaging your community on candidates in voting. And it's aimed at CCL tabling and presenting with a call to action to vote. We also have a recommended social media bonus action, posting a photo of your chapter getting out the climate vote at those events you're hosting. And we have a new chapter development bonus action, submitting a human interest story to attract new members to your chapter. And conveniently enough, our communication exercise this month builds on that theme that you heard today and what we learned about from Princella and Bob, all about practicing talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. So lastly, speaking of the Inflation Reduction Act, we'd like to actually personally invite you to a watch party. We think it would be wonderful to be together to watch President Biden sign the Inflation Reduction Act. And in that moment of history, we can remember being there together. So we're going to stream it on one of CCL's Zoom lines and enjoy some IRA trivia, dancing, meaningful conversation. We'll have a whole host of breakout rooms open for you to partake in. Now, here's the catch. The White House still hasn't announced yet when that bill signing is going to take place. But we do know that it's going to take place sometime in the next week. And so we'll make sure to email an invitation to all active CCLers as soon as we know when it's going to take place. Everyone's going to be invited. And if you want to RSVP to that current placeholder event on CCL community, I'll put that in the chat right now. You're more than welcome to RSVP yes, and we'll update it with the correct information as soon as we know. And also know this, if you can't make it on short notice, we'll be sure to record it. And you can use that same link I just dropped in the chat so you can use it as you wish for your own partying later. I do hope that your chapter of state or region comes together to savor this milestone. And with that, what I'd love to do actually is invite CCL Senior Director of Development, Lene Pettengill, to share an important update with us as well. So welcome, Lene. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be with you today and to celebrate this epic climate win together because no one gets how big this moment is like you do. 
As our development director, I'm focused on the money, which makes this work all possible. Even though it is you, the volunteers, who make this happen with your audacious strategic actions, the training and support programs for all you superstars is what we need to raise money for. This year, those programs make up a combined CCL CCE cash budget of $8.6 million. We're making steady progress towards that goal, but we need your help to get there. You might have seen the blog post our executive director, Madeline Pera, recently wrote about the stretch gift that she and her husband, Glenn, just made a climate guardian gift of $10,000. I'm on our call today to ask a favor. If your financial situation is such that you could possibly join Madeline and Glenn with a climate guardian gift of $10,000 or more, or you personally know someone who could, I ask that you contact our development team. You can do that by emailing us at development at citizensclimate.org or by calling the home office. We're working to recruit 10 new Climate Guardian donors by the end of this month. So I'm really hoping some of you will reach out right away. So let's all keep having fun with our celebrations of this awesome, incredible moment that you helped create. You just made history. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you, Lene. This is absolutely wonderful news. And uh, if also I can highlight here, you might be willing to help Lene and her team fundraise uh, by reaching out to your network of contacts, uh, contacts. You can actually attend an upcoming CCL training we're hosting this coming Thursday. I've just put that link in the chat. It's 8 p.m. Eastern time. We'd love to have you be there to learn how you can also enjoy and engage in that recruitment process for major donors. So there should be some fun with that crew too. All right, so I have two short videos to share with you to end our time to get today. It's good to recall our roots and the years of persistent work that has led to this week's milestone in both the Senate and the House. CCL, for those of you that know or are now being educated on our history, was founded in 2006 by a remarkable man from Waco, Texas named Marshall Saunders. I have a photo of Marshall on my wall that I get to look at every day as I do my work with CCL and it helps me feel centered in Marshall's vision for an organization like CCL and being the change that we wish to see in the world. And his amazing wife and widow, Pam Saunders, has a toast to offer us. And then following that, Ellie Sparks has a kind of love story to tell you about one of you. I remember from one of Marshall's speeches at conference, that he said to the volunteers, I see you as the world's best hope. Like, no kidding. You are the world's best hope. And I think today that Marshall would finally be having that cry he was always saying he'd want to have. But it would be tears of joy and gratitude and appreciation and love for each and every volunteer that has worked with CCL and for the staff and for everybody. And it is a time to stop and celebrate for a moment before moving on to the next big hurdle. And I know the volunteers are up to it because they're committed and they're strong and they're, and they're not gonna give up. And that's, that's what Marshall loved so much about them. So I say, Thank you, volunteers. Thank you for never giving up. Thank you for making the dream come true. And uh, Marshall loves you and I love you. So thank you. Well, thank you, Pam. You and Marshall have made this dream possible for all of us. So we toast to you today as well. And what we'd like to close on is a video from Ellie Sparks, our Director of Field Development, she wrote and shared a story about one of our volunteers, Jim Probst of West Virginia. You might've been paying attention to West Virginia lately. And the thing about this is that this story seems to be about one man. It's really a story about all of you and who we have become together. It just seems fitting at this time when the good people of West Virginia have had so much attention focused on their Senator that Ellie gets the chance to tell her story of Jim. And now I'm sure Jim would have told it differently, but this is Ellie's story as she lived it. So I'll let her take it from here. So back in the old days, before regional coordinators and IT departments at CCL, after I led the intro call on a conference call line with no video, 
I reviewed the list of attendees and contacted people who lived in cities where we didn't have chapters yet. Nine years ago, West Virginian Jim Propes landed on that call. I reached out first thing the next morning, eager to have someone from the mountain state. Having just completed the Climate Reality Project Presenters Program, Jim couldn't imagine talking to West Virginians about climate change. He hesitated when I asked him to start a CCL chapter. My gentle persistence convinced him to attend our first regional conference in Atlanta. He drove down from West Virginia, getting lost on the way and cursing me as he tried to find the right roads back to the main highway. He landed at the hotel late where he met Danny and Mark in the bar and the next day, Bob Inglis and 60 or so other CCLers from the Southeast. By the end of the weekend, Jim decided CCL was for him. In the closing hour, Jim asked to sing a song about nature and his grandchildren, which he accompanied with an Appalachian instrument called a dulcimer that he had built himself. Jim went home to Charleston, and I followed two months later to lead the workshop that launched his chapter. Even with the chapter backing him, Jim felt overwhelmed in West Virginia, so Joe Robertson and I met with him every other week on a call that eventually became the Coal Country Action Team. In a way, Jim was the boxer in the boxing ring, and Joe and I were the coaches. Jim would come battered and beaten into the corner. We would remove his plastic teeth, give him a drink of water, massage his shoulders, and send him back out into the ring for another round. We simply reminded him of the core CCL values and approach and told him those would work everywhere and anywhere, even in West Virginia. Jim went to his first national conference that June. Empowered by conference and lobby day, Jim committed to bringing a team from West Virginia the next year. I remember seeing our West Virginia volunteers walk into the lobby day reception at the Omni with Jim. I could see tumbleweeds rolling past them in the wind and I could hear that lonesome cowboy music and sense their horses tied to the post behind them. They walked in like they owned the place and they really did. Since that year, our West Virginia team has met regularly with all five congressional offices, including face-to-face -face meetings with Manchin, averaging eight meetings a year with members of the West Virginia delegation. Two years into their work and after they met in person with Manchin a time or two, our volunteers attended a West Virginia energy forum. Coal, oil, and natural gas made a big showing at the booths, but CCL volunteers were also there tabling. And they weren't sitting behind the table. They were out in front, catching passersby and engaging them on carbon fee and dividend at an energy conference in West Virginia. With empty chairs at their table, another unassociated energy forum attendee looking for somewhere to take a call on a cell phone sat down behind the CCL table. Can you see who that is in this photo? Senator Manchin, October 2016, catching a phone call while sitting at a CCL table at a West Virginia energy conference. I wanna tell you just a little more about Jim Probes. As he wrestled with how to talk to West Virginia miners about climate, he decided to learn more about their challenges and struggles. He joined efforts to support the Reclaim Act, communicating directly with Danny and our DC team over several years, and eventually seeing the Reclaim Act become our first alternate primary ask bill. Jim also joined the miners fighting for the Black Lung Fund. He rode their bus to D.C., attended their lobby meetings, wheeled them in wheelchairs around the Capitol office buildings so they could meet with their members of Congress seeking support of the Black Lung Fund. Jim was in one meeting, towards the end of which Senator Manchin entered saying, what can I do for you? The miners sat quietly, stunned or unsure of how to respond. Jim, well-practiced in CCL lobbying, piped up asking the Senator to extend and increase the Black Lung Fund. So when Dana reviewed the Inflation Reduction Act last Thursday night and he told us that the Black Lung Fund was part of this bill, I thought back to that meeting Jim attended in DC. 
Jim lived the CCL value of service well before we defined it as such. And we can see his impact for both people and the planet in the Inflation Reduction Act. Year after year, lobby day after lobby day, Jim and his CCL crew went back to meet with their congressional delegation. I can't imagine how hard that must have been. In fact, it exhausted Jim and he misses his grandkids, so he retired from CCL earlier this year. He's now in the West Virginia woods, growing his garden, building furniture, gathering mushrooms, strumming his handmade instruments, and playing with his grandchildren. This is what the second part of our mission looks like. A furniture maker from the West Virginia woods, a grandfather who learns about the plight of miners and discovers his voice on climate change. We empower people to have breakthroughs in personal and political power. We empower Jim, Jim Empowered Mansion. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. The beautiful thing about that story is that it's all of you on the call as well. Uh, your work, your fierce dedication, your indomitable spirits are what helped us make this week's passage of the Inflation Reduction Act possible. And I had the pleasure of communicating with Jim a couple of days ago over email to congratulate him as well. This is a man who retired from his CCL volunteer work, as Ellie just highlighted, and yet never, nevertheless had an op-ed published in the West Virginia paper the day before the deal between Senators Manchin and Schumer was announced, leading to the Inflation Reduction Act in our climate victory. And of course, nobody really knows precisely what Senate interactions and events led to this outcome. And that is what I love about us, about all of us, that we are people who take actions, who make requests, and who listen to other community members to move forward on climate solutions, despite the fact that so often we can't tell what impact it has on the outcome. And so with that reflection today, I'd like to close our call by saying thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in today. You helped make this moment possible. So I hope that you take a moment to drink that in and savor it. And for me, my thank you is also very personal. Uh, as many of you know, Julie and I are proud foster parents. And late next week, we get a welcome into this very world, our first bio child into our blended family. So here is my toast to each and every one of you. You have helped our larger country finally take a big step forward on transitioning to clean energy and a more livable world that all of you helped make possible. So with that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I ask that we close today with one of my favorite videos that CCL's marketing department ever produced, a reminder of who we are. We'll see all of you at the bill signing party whenever it is next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.